Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> Fall is fully upon us, isn't it? So for those of you who are keeping score at home, um, I can say there's one team that has more depth and more experience, has shown that they are much more explosive. Uh, they seem to be able to bring wave after wave of offensive weapons to the field, and basically they're threatening to simply bury their opposition with an unstoppable onslaught. <clears throat> I'm not talking about the Dodgers uh, and the Rays. Uh, that was an unbelievable game last night, wild and crazy. And I'm not talking about the Chiefs and the Broncos, uh, though I can't say I have a lot of hope for a good outcome this afternoon. And I'm certainly not talking about the debacle in Manhattan yesterday. No, I'm talking about uh, the leaves and me. The game's not over, and my poor old Rake and I are holding our own, though um, with some advice, I have considered shopping for a flamethrower. <clears throat> well, the World Series and football and raking leaves, those, those aren't the only annual fall events around here. Um, October is also the time that we focus our commitments on our commitments to one another as a church, and specifically our commitments to church membership and to stewardship. But let's think back a little bit. One year ago, at this time, we were recovering from a difficult time of trauma as a church. But it was a time to be grateful. Uh, God was healing us as a church family. We were recovering our sense of being one church. you recall that we went through a lengthy set of uh, three series of sermons, all related to the basic idea of rebuilding community. We looked at the fundamental necessity of making worship a priority. We reminded ourselves that the foundation of our faith had to be built upon the Word of God, and that the only way we could rebuild our community was to rebuild according to the teaching of Jesus. <clears throat> we examined what it meant to rebuild the walls of our identity as God's people, to be defined by our allegiance to Jesus Christ and to walk as His disciples in accordance with the New Covenant. So yes, we had been through trauma, but we were recovering. And we were praising God for what he was doing with us. And there was a sense of joy that had returned. There was a confidence in God. We were encouraged by his presence and by what we sensed when we were together as a church family. We knew there was work to do, but the future was looking brighter. And even our finances told the same story. Because at this time last year, as we began preparing to ask for stewardship commitments, we were hopeful, uh, but we were unsure of what to expect. Your response was wonderful, and it was encouraging. We finished 2019 in the black as a church. Uh, <clears throat> and just to rehearse, at the beginning of the last year, we were hoping that if we could get to something within a $25,000 deficit, we would be doing well. And we finished in the black. And so we were extraordinarily pleased, and we had commitments from 2020 that gave us... Uh, uh, a realistic expectation for confidence and optimism in what God was going to do, even though we knew we were facing some fairly seriously expensive repairs. <clears throat> then 2020 arrived. <coughs> Excuse me. Our three weeks of prayer and fasting at the start of the year went very well. We had a, a real strong sense of unity. God was moving in our midst. And even though we had to face the loss of several dear friends in those first few months, we remain committed to rebuilding this community of God's people and enjoying the presence of God. We're focused on following Jesus together, learning to listen for his voice in all the ways he might speak to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then came this guy, COVID-19. <clears throat> Fo followed very quickly <coughs> by social upheaval over racial issues and Suddenly, 2020 became the year to remember for all the wrong reasons. In a rapidly spreading pandemic and explosive anger over injustices turned our lives upside down and inside out. We've been cloistered in our homes for most of the past six to eight months, forced to refrain from seeing friends and loved ones. We've started watching church online instead of being here. All of our familiar routines have been disrupted. Our favorite activities have been nixed. And 
Nearly everything we need to do is now more difficult and less enjoyable. There's no way to sugarcoat it. This has been a hard year. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge that together? If, if you're sitting here with your spouse or a family member or, or, or a friend, I just want to invite you to take each other's hand. And if you're here by yourself, just close your eyes and imagine you're taking the hand of Jesus and, and just take a moment and offer him all of the pain and all of the frustration and all of the stuff of 2020 so far and give it to Jesus. Just do it right now. When you're done, just take a big breath and then exhale it real deeply and let the Spirit of God cleanse your heart and your mind of all the junk that's been weighing on you because of COVID and because of racism and your failures or your financial problems or the isolation or the loneliness. Just let it all go to Him. Let the Spirit of God bring you himself in its place. And if you feel like screaming, uh, maybe wait till you're alone in the bathroom or in your car so nobody thinks you're being attacked. You know. But go ahead. I mean, God can take it. <clears throat> A good scream. I'm not into primal screaming or anything like that, but God can handle it. It can be appropriate at times. But the hardships are not the only things to remember about this year because God has been faithful to us. And the, and the truth is that for most of us, the hardships of this year have been annoyances and frustrations. They've been challenges, maybe some setbacks. <clears throat> it is beyond frustrating to be cooped up in our houses. But we have houses. We can order food. No one is shooting at us in our homes or shutting off our water and electricity because we worship Jesus or, or throwing us in prison because we own a Bible. The coronavirus is still spreading, and that's, that's a still a real concern. But we can take precautions that give us a, a reasonable amount of protection and safety. Nothing in this life is 100% risk-free. But as believers, we can live without fear, because God has promised to walk with us through every challenge, promised to fight our battles for us and to fight with us. Plus, we have his promise of everlasting life through the resurrection of Christ. At the end of the day, there's nothing that can happen to us that... God can't handle. God has been faithful. It has been hard. And our church, like nearly every other church out there, has taken some hits that have set us back. But we're still here. And we're still rebuilding this community. We're still following Jesus. We're still rebuilding the walls of our identity as God's people. We're actually even rebuilding the walls here. Physical walls. <clears throat> we're still one church. So that being said, it's still good to say out loud that it feels awful to be separated from family and friends. And rightly so. I mean, God didn't create us to be isolated. He didn't create us to be separated from loved ones and family. And that's why it feels horrible to not see everyone at church. And I'm glad you're waving at us, but we wish you could wave at us here. <clears throat> we understand why you can't, and that's okay. Because we're still one church. Amen? Look at somebody and smile, just for the heck of it. Because this being isolated affects us, okay? And not being together affects us negatively. And that's why the theme for our stewardship commitment season this year is this, forward together. I'll be saying more about that in the weeks to come, but for today, I just want to remind you that God hasn't left us to fend for ourselves. He hasn't left us to wither away in isolation, <clears throat> He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't abandoned your friends that you don't get to see. He hasn't abandoned this church, this congregation. He didn't help us recover to leave us just limping along. I, I put the words, the chorus of an old imperial song up on the screen for you. I love this old song. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. And he didn't make his home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. <clears throat> it's a great song. You can find it on Spotify, I think, <laughs> if you don't still have the cassette tape. <laughs> I think we have the record, but we don't have a way to play it. So. 
Well, the point is, if we're going forward together, we need to understand something very clearly. What we're doing in this stewardship commitment season, this, this campaign, going forward together is not about whipping up support for some grand cause or a project. We're not trying to attract a crowd to see our show. What we are doing is following Jesus and inviting others to follow with us. And that means that we have to understand what our message is, what his message is. Because if we're followers of Christ, we are not free to invent our own message. We don't have the option of polling the masses to see what they favor and what they'll buy and then crafting our message to fit what they like. Jesus already gave us a message. He gave us the gospel, and he expects us to understand it and to pass it on to those who will listen. So this morning, we heard four passages, two from the gospel of John, one from Mark, and one from uh, Luke, Luke, the longer one with two parts from Luke's gospel. Each of those passages has an important piece of Jesus' message for us to grasp if we're going to identify with Jesus as his followers, if we're going to identify with his message, so we'll start with the first passage from John 3, with perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now John 3.16 is a fabulous verse. I actually don't mind at all that it's the most famous verse. It tells us so much that is crucial about God and his plan for salvation. God loves the world. What's the world? That's everyone on the planet. It's not just the, this piece of rock hurtling around the sun. That's the beginning of the gospel. God loves us, every one of us, no matter who we are or how we look or what we've done or what we haven't done. He loves us completely and absolutely and constantly. He loves us without hesitation. He loves us without regrets without conditions. He will always love everyone. And God's love led him to make eternal life with him possible. He made a way through his unique son, Jesus the Messiah. Whoever would believe in him, that is, would completely trust in Jesus, surrender his or her life to him, whoever would do that would receive the gift of eternal life. That's the beginning point of the gospel. <clears throat> But we need to read the part that follows this famous verse as well. Because there is a huge assumption that is hidden in John 3.16. An assumption that is unpacked in the verses after it. John 3.16 assumes that there is something that is preventing everyone in the world from receiving eternal life. John 3.16 assumes that there is a reason that the world needs saving in the first place. It isn't enough to be loved by God. The fact that God loves you does not mean that you automatically get eternal life just because he loves you. See, God loves you in spite of the fact that you and every person breathing air on this planet that has ever done so stands under his condemnation because of sin. But as the next verse shows us, God did not send his son to condemn us. He sent him to save us. That's the good news. But the passage in John does not excuse or ignore evil. It doesn't pretend that evil doesn't matter, and neither should we. This world, everyone on the planet, including you, this world needs saving because this world... Everyone on the planet, including you, loves darkness. We all love our own sin. We may not love somebody else's sin, but we all love our own. We love being the ruler of the kingdom of me, rather than submitting to God. And the world insists on following darkness. In fact, the world calls darkness light. But evil is not good. I don't care how many parades you hold. The parade won't make evil good. And the world will promote <clears throat> and celebrate its own crookedness, refuses to admit its need for salvation and for God. <clears throat> In fact, the world not only celebrates its own sinfulness, it mocks and berates those who point it out, just as it did when Jesus came and he showed them the light. 
Jesus said, because I show them uh, the truth, they have no excuse. <clears throat> so the question is, are you and I, are we, the people, everyone breathing air on this planet, are we going to remain in the darkness? And that takes us to our second passage, which is in Mark chapter 1. It's a very short one. Mark summarizes the essence of Jesus' in his initial preaching in a single pointed proclamation. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus bursts on the scene with a proclamation of good news. Jesus says the kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. The time is fulfilled. The time of which the prophets spoke has come. When the promises of God will be fulfilled, when God's going to intervene and save his people, it's here. It's now, he says. Salvation is at hand. God has sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but in, in order that the world might be saved. That is Jesus' message from the very start of his ministry. But notice what he says. He says there's a proper and necessary response to that proclamation. He doesn't say the kingdom of God has come. Everyone cheer. He says the kingdom of God has come. Everyone repent and believe. Not just believe, repent and believe. Repentance is a necessary part of the gospel message. If you do not include the need to repent in that proclamation, you don't have a gospel. You don't have good news. Because without repentance, you don't have genuine faith. You can say you believe in Jesus, but if you refuse to repent from the sin that you know has captured you, the darkness that you love and don't want to admit, if you refuse to repent, then your claim to believe is incomplete at best. And at worst, it's an empty and meaningless statement. The kingdom of God has come. <clears throat> but you can't live in the kingdom of God and continue to live as the king or the queen of your own life. If you want the goodness of the kingdom of God, all the blessings and the joy that comes from being a part of God's kingdom, if you want the life of eternity, not just later when you die, but now, free from all of the darkness of this life, the only way to get there is through repentance and faith in Jesus. And that's what Jesus said. This is the message that he gives us, that God loved the world. He still loves the world. He sent his son to save us. And he invites us to repent and believe so that we can inherit salvation and eternal life. That's the gospel message of Jesus. So let's go back to John. Chapter 20. At the close of his gospel, he tells us another important part of this gospel message. He says it's based on eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of Jesus after he was crucified. Including the testimony of one disciple who initially didn't believe the reports that Jesus was alive again. And Thomas, who was at least honest about his unwillingness to believe, well, he was there in the same room where Jesus had appeared to the other disciples. And Jesus gave him another chance. He appeared to him again. He showed Thomas his wounds and invited him to believe and follow. And to his credit, Thomas was immediately humbled. He was remorseful. And he recognized Jesus as his Lord and his God. Now, folks, that is no small step for, for anyone, especially for Thomas who, like all of the other first disciples, were Jews. What, what, what's so big about that? Well, Jews only believe there's only one God, and he's not one of us. Except now he was, because they'd seen the only God there was in the person of Jesus, their Lord and Messiah, their King. And so these, that these Jewish disciples of Jesus would go against everything they'd ever known, everything that had ever been taught, that screams for an explanation. How is that possible? And the best explanation, the only credible explanation, is that they had seen something impossible happen that changed them completely. They had seen a man they knew quite well be crucified, die, be buried, come back from the grave alive, transformed in glory three days later, just like he said. They had experienced the living God when Jesus appeared to them, the same Jesus they had followed and been with for three years, the same Jesus they had watched die on a cross. He was now alive and well and still carrying the scars of his crucifixion. And so they told the story to the world. 
I suppose it's possible that Jesus could appear to someone today. Um, He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus a few years after the resurrection, but that was a special exception. Even Paul admitted that. I don't know people who've had visions, but I don't recommend waiting for that to happen if you're thinking, well, that's what I need to be convinced. If he would just do that for me like Paul, then I'd be convinced. Because John tells us that the signs and the miracles that are recorded in his gospel, including the resurrection, they were written down by eyewitnesses so that you could read and believe and have life in his name as a result. The testimony, he said, is true, and that testimony has been offered to you. So like Jesus said to Thomas, he's saying to us today, to anyone out there who wants to hear this message, stop doubting and believe. It's a choice you make to humble yourself before God, and if you do, you'll find something you never had before. You'll find life. Which brings us to the passage in Luke, specifically to the latter half of that passage, because Jesus adds an important warning to those who are listening to him. They've heard that God loves them. Jesus has made that abundantly clear in the way he's welcomed them. They're sinners in need of his help, and he's helped them. They've seen him heal people with a word, with a touch of his hand. They know that God's power is evident in his life. His teaching is like anything they've ever heard before. And he's inviting them to follow him, to experience the kingdom of God for themselves. But he adds a cautionary warning. It's really quite startling when you think about it. It, It's so very foreign to all the stuff we see around us in, in this day and age when it seems like everyone's trying to get a following. Jesus tells those who are listening to him, and by the way, this is his target audience. These are the people who are predisposed to like him. They have already started paying attention to him. They're seriously considering that he might be the Messiah. And he warns them to count the cost of following him. He says, you have to renounce everything and everyone if you want to follow me. Really? I mean, is that the way to gain followers? Telling them they have to give up everything? That they have to choose him above family? I mean, hasn't he watched any of the Hallmark movies? Or, or, or even a mafia movie? I mean, doesn't he know that family is the most important thing? But that's exactly what Jesus insists. When he, when he says you must hate your father and mother, wife, children, brother, sister, Jesus is not advocating hatred of others, okay? I mean, after all, he taught us we had to love everyone, including our enemies. So it doesn't make any sense that he would require his followers to hate their family. <clears throat> Jesus is using hyperbole. Hyperbole is intentionally exaggerating something to the extreme in order to make a point. See, the culture of the first century, particularly among the Jews, was that family really was the most important thing. Your relationships within your immediate, your extended family, well, those were the bridges that were crucial for every social relationship, every business transaction, every every interaction with the outside world. And so maintaining family honor was the highest virtue and obtaining the family's approval for everything that you did, for your actions, that was an obligation. To go against the family's wishes, particularly that of your father, was dishonorable. It would bring shame upon you. It would bring shame on the family. It was an unthinkable act of betrayal. And yet Jesus insists, if you're going to be his disciple, he must have priority in your life above even the approval of your closest family members. There's a cost, he says, to being a disciple. You have to be willing to forsake everything, even at the cost of your own life, to follow him. He's not saying you have to abandon your relationships with your family or cut yourselves off from them. He said you do have to forsake their claim to your absolute allegiance and their claim to determine what you're going to do. Now, most of us have never had to face those kind of decisions, at least not overtly. Most of us aren't going to be disowned by the rest of our family if we follow Jesus. I know someone who was. In fact, I know a couple. And there are multiplied thousands and perhaps millions today around the world who have chosen Jesus knowing that their family will not only disown them, They will actively persecute them, perhaps even hunt them down to kill them for becoming a Christian. um, Most of us don't have that problem. The cost, however, remains the same. 
And it tends to come to us in what seem to be really small ways, things that seem insignificant. They're all intended to turn you back from your commitment to Jesus. For example, you become a Christian and suddenly friends and family don't understand why you want to spend Sunday mornings at church. So they start pressuring you very subtly to, to go with them to the park or to the restaurant instead of the church, or at least back when restaurants were open, you know. <clears throat> or the pregame rituals before watching NFL start earlier now. or Whatever the family's favorite things to do are that suddenly conflict with following Jesus or being in church or being part of a small group or serving, all of those things start being magnified by your family or by your friends or by your boss or by your business partner. And you have to decide, am I going to follow Jesus, whatever it costs, or am I going to follow Jesus only if it doesn't conflict with my career plans or my recreational needs or, or my social standing or my family's favorite traditions? Here's a thought. Why not invite your family or your boss or your co-workers to join you on this journey of following Jesus. And that brings us to our final section, to the first part of the passage from Luke 14. It's one of Jesus' parables. The point is fairly simple, pretty direct. It's all about the value of the kingdom of God. A man is giving a banquet. And that's a picture of God. The banquet represents being welcomed into the kingdom. See, the banquet was a common symbol in Jewish literature at that, that, that time for the coming of the kingdom of God. By the way, that's one of the reasons that Jesus spent so much time eating with sinners. It was a way of presenting the truth with an acted out symbol of that truth of the kingdom of God. So God is welcoming people into his kingdom. He sends the invitation out. Everything's prepared. Come into the banquet. But everyone has an excuse. It's not a convenient time for me right now. I, I'm too busy. I got this real estate deal going down and I got this business transaction that really needs my attention. You know, work is just really busy for me right now. Or I, I'm married and, and my, my wife or my husband, they, they, they need me at home. You know, the kids have soccer all the time and my job takes all the rest of my time and my wife and I barely have enough time to get the camper ready for summer or get the yard ready for winter or just barely have time to get the house ready for company or whatever. See, there are always people who are far more concerned about this life, about catching up, getting ahead, making your mark, getting your career started, getting your retirement plan funded, you know, fixing up the house, buying a new house. Those things aren't necessarily bad. But people who choose those over Jesus don't value what God has offered them. Because all they can see is what they want right now. And if, you don't all, if that's what you're focused on, there will always be an excuse for not being able to follow Jesus now. Because there's a cost. And the cost is part of the message, and we are not at liberty to leave it out when we tell others about Jesus. There is a cost. It costs you your life. You have to give it all up to follow Jesus. See, our message is not... It's fine for you to keep living for what you can get in this world just, just as long as you come to church. That's not our message. Our message is what Jesus said, that God loves you, that he made a way for you to be saved because you need saving. You're not okay. He offers you the best that there is. It's life in the kingdom of God. He freely offers it to you. You can't purchase it, but it will cost you everything. It'll cost you your life. Because it's worth far more than anything you could ever have or could obtain. But here's the secret that you really need to understand. And it's a secret we need to make sure that others understand when we tell them the story. To tell them the good news. There's a cost if you don't follow Jesus as well. In fact, it's the same cost. It's doubled. Because not following Jesus will still cost you your whole life. You're going to lose it all. You're going to lose your life. You're going to lose all you've tried to hold on to so hard. You'll lose it all. 
And you'll also lose all that you could have gotten by following Jesus. Eternal life. So choose Jesus. I didn't say that very well. So choose Jesus. Choose the kingdom of God. Choose to identify with Jesus as his follower. Embrace him and his message because it will transform you forever and you have forever to enjoy it. That's our message. Identify with Jesus.